Well, as a historian, I know that slavery ended with the 13th Amendment in 1865, but the 13th Amendment has an exception in it for people who are convicted of crimes. They can still be subject to involuntary servitude. So maybe mass incarceration can be seen as the afterlife of slavery. We have a bigger prison population than any other country in the world. That has to make us think about the relationship between our privilege, our liberty, our freedom, and someone else's deprivation, someone else's confinement. I think there's a kind of trauma at the beginning of our history. Prison looks like the middle passage because it is the middle passage. The reason prison looks like slavery is because it is slavery. It's a repetition of a historical drama. So the people in prison, the people wearing chains today, look like the people wearing chains uh, yesterday. I don't think there's a causal connection. Slavery abolitionists and uh, uh, those opposed slavery uh, often tended to be associated with the incarceration movement because they saw it as a much less cruel, much less violent alternative to corporal and capital punishment. The causes behind mass incarceration have to do with New York State's um, mandatory minimum sentencing laws that were promoted by Governor Rockefeller, particularly in the wake of the Attica uprising at Attica Prison in New York State. When you have the black rebellions in the U.S. prison system in the late 60s and 70s, most of which are being animated by black liberation theory, that has a sort of a serious effect on notions of black criminality. Because in fact, one of the ideas that becomes very prevalent in this period is that any form of black radical thought, particularly that's bound up with theories of decolonization and resistance to empire abroad, is a threat to the state and is a criminal act. The way to reform prison is to not have prison. We don't have prison for the wealthy, the people who are in the 1%, let alone the one-tenth of 1%, right, the actual power you need. Uh, they don't go to prison. Prison has been abolished for the wealthy. Prison is something we do to the poor. Maybe one group's freedom depends on another group's confinement. And that's not just slavery. We can think about the United States and its colonization of Native American lands the same way. Native Americans um, are considered to have their own sovereign nations. Those uh, sovereign nations, which are embedded within the U.S. itself, are actually reservations. And interestingly, these Indian reservations came about at the end of a series of pretty brutal warfare. Colonizing forces have wanted to find a justification for their process of colonization. And the justification is a racial language. The Bureau of Justice Statistics tells us that now the prison population of African American men has reached 900,000 or is tipping towards a million. Those ostensible facts shaping where we live, where, do, where we send our children, our comfort level with certain parts of the city, like the application now, the, the sketchy application, which tells young white hipsters where not to go in certain gentrifying neighborhoods. There's no moment in US history, none, zero, zilch, when black people we're not fighting against or resisting against that stigmatizing and policy-rooted notion of black people's criminality. As a result of that, we are willing to pay for a certain number of unlawful executions of these people because the cost of settlement in our cities is less than the cost of white fear of inhabiting those same cities. It's okay to shoot first, ask questions later. Because the value of that life is worth less as an individual than it is for your sense of public safety. I don't think we as academics need to come up with a set of observable criteria by which we can compare one condition of racialized oppression to another. But the idea that inmates continually liken their condition to slavery and that that matters as a touchstone for radical black social organizing in the prison and beyond is absolutely relevant. It's 
so in a in a privatized neoliberal world where plutocracy displaces democracy we've decided that we should have more money for the few less money for the many and therefore fewer jobs for everyone and prison becomes a way of regulating the redundancy of labor So what changes and what stays the same? What about the relationship of domination that slavery secured? What about the expectation that high status and low status people have radically different social outcomes? And that black people stay poor, that their children be poor, and that their children's children be poor. That's continued. Men of color who enter the prison system oftentimes um, have lived lives outside of the prison that resemble their life within the prison. All of the things that happen inside of the prison happen outside of the prison. That isn't to say that there's nothing different about the prison. Clearly the prison is very unique in the, in the ways in which it intensifies forms of carcerality that are outside of the prison, where everything for people of color, for poor people in this country, becomes enclosed. It becomes a deprived, it's, it's sort of a state of, of, depri of deprivation, of political, economic, of social deprivation. change is not just the details of a legal system, but a whole way of conceiving relationships that expects and even encourages racial domination. If we're looking for the way forward, we have to look in the prisons themselves. We have to look first at the prisoners. You have the hunger strikes that started in the um, security housing units in California and Pelican Bay and that radiated across the state. You have the resistance to that prison industrial complex in the prison system itself and the prisoners. I think it's important for us as people outside of the prison to understand the ways in which these movements now are connected to other movements across the world.